かっこいいぞかっこいいぞああ俺の車終わった On March 11th, 2011, a tsunami resulting from a magnitude 9.1 earthquake pummeled the Japanese coastline. Within a single day, millions would be without power. Over a hundred thousand buildings would be destroyed, and over 19,000 people would be missing or dead. It was the single greatest loss of life Japan had suffered since nuclear bombs flattened Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Beset by walls of water of the exact height numerous reports warned of, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant drowned. It lost power. Then backup power, then the ability to adequately cool nuclear fuel. Then it exploded three times, releasing plumes of radioactive smoke over the surrounding area. It would be only the third time that corium, a deadly mixture of nuclear fuel, metal, and concrete, was created by accident. The mitigation of the Fukushima nuclear disaster continues ten years on. Thousands of tons of radioactive topsoil still sit in innumerable black bags stacked in pyramids on rural roads. Thousands of workers still move in and out of the power plant, cleaning, maintaining, and decommissioning. Most globally relevant, however, is the recently approved plan to release stored radioactive water back into the ocean. That started just a few days ago and will continue for anywhere from seven. To 40 years. I spent 10 days in the Fukushima exclusion zone in the April of 2023. I took a Geiger counter to mostly abandoned roads. I walked the once inundated coastline and saw remediation efforts firsthand, all of which you will see over the course of this series. I also got to access the inside of the Fukushima Daiichi power plant itself and held a sample of the radioactive water TEPCO will be releasing. With my own hands. And that's where things got complicated. You see, I had my own preconceived notions about what a tour of Fukushima Daiichi would actually be like. And while I can say that my tour wasn't surprising, I'd encountered similar conditions in Chernobyl, the tour was confusing. And I think that's a big problem with big consequences. This is the true story. Of Fukushima's radioactive water. Both the power and potential danger of nuclear fuel is that, in the right configuration, it heats itself up. In a functional power plant, rods filled with uranium pellets, moderated by both water and reaction killing control rods, emit high energy particles that cause nearby rods to do the same. Precisely controlled, This process generates an enormous amount of heat, which the reactor uses to boil water, turn turbines, and ultimately generate electricity. This happens safely every day all over the world. In the ruins of Fukushima Daiichi's reactors, however, heat is still being produced by melted fuel, and radiation rates prevent any kind of fine grain control. Water is therefore constantly pumped through the reactors to prevent another meltdown. That water inevitably mixes with the corium and other debris and becomes radioactive itself. For the last decade, all of this contaminated water has been stored on site at Daiichi in giant tanks that now take up the vast majority of the plant's square footage. And as of this year, they started running out of room. The cooling of Daiichi's ruins creates 130 to 150 cubic meters. 150,000 kilograms of contaminated cooling water, rainwater, and groundwater every single day. Japanese and international experts have determined that building more and more on site storage is not a viable long term solution, and so a plan was proposed to release processed water back into the sea, like every other similarly situated nuclear power plant does as a part of daily operations. The main contaminant in this water. Is tritium, a hydrogen atom with two extra neutrons. It's a beta emitter with a half life of around 12.3 years, created naturally when cosmic rays interact with Earth's atmosphere. It then circulates through the hydrological cycle, 
about 99% of all tritium, natural or man-made, is incorporated in water and follows the water cycle from the high atmosphere to the sea. The problem with it is that tritiated water is chemically identical to regular water, and so human bodies use it the same way. Beta radiation can't penetrate very far, but inhaled, absorbed, or ingested, as close to your vital organs as possible, tritium can be dangerous. Thankfully, tritium is, relatively speaking, only dangerous in large concentrations and excreted from the body just like water. And so it's concentration that Fukushima will control and monitor after using highly technical water treatment methods to remove 62 much more harmful radioisotopes. Why not also just remove the tritium? Well, the multinucleide removal or ALPS process that Fukushima Daiichi is using to treat the contaminated water can't remove all the tritium for the same reason your body takes it up like water. It's too chemically close to H2O, too hard to separate from the normal molecule. The International Atomic Energy Agency has agreed with Japan on this point. The IAEA is, quote, not aware of any solution currently available for the separation of tritium commensurate with the concentration and the volume of treated water." End quote. In other words, if you had a process to separate out all this slightly different H2O, you would probably just still remove all of the H2O. Thousands and thousands of tons of radioactive water can't simply accumulate for the next four decades at Daiichi, especially considering the risk posed to the tanks by another possible earthquake and or tsunami. And so starting just a few days ago, TEPCO will release treated water into the ocean via a one kilometer long undersea tunnel at an agreed upon concentration. Here, it will mix with seawater, which already contains a natural amount of tritium, diluting it to safe levels. At least, that's what TEPCO is claiming. But the science is on their side. Dilution is deceptively powerful, and there's effectively an infinite amount of seawater. So again, the key factor here will be concentration, the amount of radiation per liter in the treated water. That concentration, according to TEPCO, will be 1,500 becquerels per liter, or water that decays in some way 1,500 times per second per liter. This is far below the regulatory levels for many other countries, as well as the World Health Organization's drinking water quality guidelines. It's also far below the levels in water discharged by many functioning power plants every year. France, TEPCO likes to point out, discharges 500 times more tritium into the ocean than Fukushima ever will. But that begs the question, how safe is this 1,500 becquerels per liter limit? Well, according to the math, very. If Fukushima's diluted seawater mix was drinkable, for example, you could drink two liters a day of it, direct from an undersea pipe, direct from a nuclear disaster, and after a year, you still wouldn't have accumulated one-tenth of one percent of the dose that is agreed upon to cause negative health effects. In fact, you wouldn't be able to physically consume enough of this treated water to irradiate you. You would drown before you got a dangerous dose. At least, this is what the international community has been told, what I was told. All of the documents you're seeing throughout this piece I got from TEPCO directly. At present moment, I have no real reason to doubt all of the facts and figures. I can't actually imagine an industry or a company that is under more international and domestic pressure to fix all of their mistakes and get it all right. However, even if all of these facts and figures are true, the way that they were being presented to the public, the way that they were presented to me, was a little confusing. And I know because I was there to hold the treated water with my own hands. Unlike my tour of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, where we were allowed to film basically anything other than the security systems and military personnel, there were no cameras of any kind allowed at Fukushima Daiichi. And so I'm here recording my recollection of the plant tour well after the fact. Now I've used words like confusing in this piece because as someone who's generally knowledgeable about nuclear physics and nuclear disasters, I immediately noticed a confusing difference between what I knew about the plant 
than what I was told by the plant. The three-hour tour started with a full briefing. We turned in our passports for copying and received about 80 pages of documents. Everything from timelines to medical reports to infographic-filled explainers on tritium. With the help of a translator, we went through a few of the pages relating to what we would soon see for ourselves. I wrote down notes in the margins. We were then asked to file into a theater in the visitor center. There, we sat down for what could be only described as a long apology. On March 11, 2011, a severe accident occurred at the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Station. We sincerely apologize to residents in Fukushima Prefecture and all people in society for causing serious damage and having caused tremendous ongoing burden, anxiety, and inconvenience. After the apology was over, the tour group was ushered onto a bus. A dosimeter with a large red readout flickered in one of the seats, telling us the ambient dose rate inside of the vehicle. The bus tour began. We passed workers, some in regular clothes, others in full hazmat gear. The TEPCO representative on board was proud of the fact that street clothes were now sufficient protection in the majority of the plant. We passed a street where purposefully and carefully maintained cherry blossom trees bloomed each year. We unfortunately had missed those by only a week or two. The dosimeter ticked up as we drove. As we got closer to the failed reactors, I had to turn my personal Geiger counter off. The alarm was blaring. This is when I started to get confused. At the start of the tour and before the bus ride, the ambient radiation wasn't anything to notice. And there's something to be said for that, for the efficacy of a decade of decontamination. But by the time we stopped at the husks of reactors 1 and 2, I can confidently say that I've never stood in a place so radioactive. And I likely never will again. When I was just a stone's throw away from Chernobyl's sarcophagus, the decades-old fuel still produced a background rate of radiation of 20 microsieverts per hour. When I was more than 100 meters away from Fukushima's decaying fuel, the radiation rate was more than 400% higher. Now, I don't want to mislead you here. Even a higher than Chernobyl dose rate will not be dangerous if you follow the twin principles of ALARA, as low a dose as reasonably achievable, and TDS, Time Distance Shielding. As such, we didn't spend more than 15 minutes inside of Chernobyl's new safe confinement and were pressured for time by plant personnel. But outside of Fukushima's ruined reactors is where we were told to get off the bus, necessarily minimizing shielding and distance. There we were lectured once more, maximizing time. There was apparently enough time for a Q&A session. We even stopped to pose for a group photo. This short stop was the best example of the risk-reward calculation that the Japanese government and plant operator TEPCO were making. It is very good PR that members of the public can stand so close to the disaster that is only superseded by Chernobyl in infamy. But this stunt gave me a dose that was not as low as reasonably achievable. This was bad radiation safety. Is the reward of good public perception greater than the small risk posed by a larger than necessary dose? It's very possible, but it's ethically complicated. We got back on the bus and returned to the visitor center. The tour ended with a discussion of the tritiated water that would soon be released into the ocean. The finale was a large see-through plastic container of water, treated water once held in one of the hundreds of storage tanks on site. We passed it around the room and examined it closely. As we did, a plant employee explained how tritiated water would meet international safety requirements before ocean release and how a release of this kind is actually standard operation for all nuclear power plants. Again, this was good PR for the immense reputational damage done to TEPCO. This is the water you're so scared of. Hold it. Look at it. See? Nothing to worry about. But again, for anyone who knows anything about radiation, this presentation was confusing. 
irradiated water doesn't look like anything. It's not muddy, it doesn't glow like a nuclear reactor. They could have handed us dangerously contaminated water and it would have looked exactly the same. We could have held personal Geiger counters up to it, and we did, and nothing would have clicked because beta radiation doesn't make it through thick plastic like that in the first place. It was a great hands-on visual, but ultimately, slightly misleading. Risk, reward. As a public communicator myself, I completely agree that standing in front of ruined reactors and handling canisters of treated water are powerful experiences that can say a lot and could change public opinion. But as a scientist, I don't agree with unnecessarily putting people in probably the hottest environment they'll ever be in for an unnecessary amount of time. And keep in mind, they didn't tell us the background rates there beforehand. If I had known, I probably would have stayed on the bus, where I could still easily see the reactors. Nor do I understand using a canister of what could have been tap water to highlight their decontamination efforts. Visiting an experiment like the one that was done with two population of flounder in both seawater and treated seawater would have been far more powerful, just as visual and not as misleading. Maybe these are the risks that are necessary and needed for TEPCO specifically in Japan generally to overcome what is undoubtedly the worst public image for any industry ever, especially in a country with a more than complicated history with nuclear physics. Overcoming this obstacle is something that I'm not confused about and that I'm sympathetic to. Simulations show that as treated water makes its way back to the ocean, any increase in radiation will be localized to the coast, and those increased doses pose no real physical risk to the wildlife or to the public. The tritiated water will be monitored before, during, and after it meets the ocean, a process that could take as long as the decommissioning of the power plant itself, 30 to 40 years. As I said, I have no real reason to think any of this is false or dangerous. The water from this tsunami did far more long-term damage to Japan than treated water could ever possibly do. Yes, the tour and the public presentation of the state of Fukushima is, in my opinion, less than perfect, but I do understand the risk-reward calculation, and I could see making it myself. This is an extremely complicated situation. The complex interplay between government regulation, corporate interests, nuclear physics, and public perception easily accounts for suboptimal risk communication, especially in a culture of duty and enormous social pressure to save face. You hear that pressure in the apologies. You see it on the public televisions. And you read it in the children's books you can buy in the exclusion zone. Is Fukushima's plan to release radioactive seawater back into the ocean safe? Yes, the Pacific Ocean contains around 8,000 grams of tritium naturally. The total amount of tritium held in Fukushima's water tanks is less than 3 grams. Negligible. However, is this plan being presented to the public in some unhelpful and slightly misleading ways? Also, yes and that has real consequences. China, for example, has already imposed a preemptive blanket ban on all Japanese seafood, which will have huge economic effects. Environmentalist groups are stoking fears by saying that the plan is like, quote, diluting whiskey and coke, both fundamentally misunderstanding what concentration is and what alcohol by volume means, apparently. I wouldn't call what is happening at Fukushima a PR disaster, like Three Mile Island was, but I wouldn't call it the nuclear industry's first PR success, either. There are no easy answers here. We'll see if that changes, and I hope that it does. They have the next 40 years to get it right. Until next time.